Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Alessia Moretti, who's a friend of mine from university. We studied basically at the same time at the Padova University in Italy. Uh, Alessia has, uh, did her master thesis there on chemical evolution of the intracluster medium. Then she went on for a PhD, same university as myself did. Um, uh, with uh, studying uh, globular cluster system in other galaxies. She spent during the PhD uh, period in Munich collaborating with uh, Stefan Charlot on the interpretation of cellular population in the system. Then she went on uh, on um, a postdoc on a quite different subject, uh, multi-conjugate optics uh, at VLT. So it was a test case for an instrument to be placed there. And in part of others, uh, um, very strong group doing instrumentation, so she collaborated with them. And then she went on with another postdoc uh, back to studying galaxy or wings. So, which is a uh, this uh, survey, she will basically talk a little bit about of uh, galaxy in uh, clusters. And then she also uh, had planning and uh, develop the Omega wings follow up. So, a survey which uh, took data in the outer part of the galaxy cluster, and then another, yet another postdoc uh, in uh, GASP, a project she will talk about today, uh, doing the data reduction, the first analysis, and scientific exploitation. But uh, now, uh, what she will talk about to us um, is uh, molecular uh, gas in jellyfish galaxies, so that's basically a follow up of the GASP project. Uh, and so, Alexa, please. Thanks. Um, yes. Thank you, Jacopo, for the nice presentation. And thank you for having invited me uh, to give this talk in beautiful Mexico that I will visit sooner or later. So as Jacopo said, my talk will be about the molecular gas content of RAM pressure strip galaxies. And since I think that uh, not all of you are uh, expert in this galaxy field, I will try to first convince you on why we think that uh, galaxies and the environment feel each other. So I start with this uh, only one slide on the importance of studying environment uh, when we want to understand galaxy evolution. So the figure that you see here on the top right panel is basically the morphology density relation that we found uh, in our own uh, uh, survey that is called WINGS. And you see um, in red uh, the fraction of early type galaxy, in blue the fraction of late type galaxies, and uh, down here you see the local densities. And you basically see that when you move in the distance cluster region, uh, there is a predominance of early type galaxies at the expenses of late type galaxies. This is well known, we didn't discover it. It's known since the 80s from the pioneeristic work by Alan Dressler. There is another thing that I want to highlight, and that is that the star formation rate density in the same sample of clusters is actually declining when you go from redshift above one to below one. And if you compare the declining of the star formation rate density with the um, galaxies that have that are in the field observed in exactly the same way, you find that the uh, quench is, is much more efficient in clusters. So there must be something in the dense environment that is able to efficiently quench uh, the star formation in galaxies and leading to the morphological transformation that we observe. Now, using the wings and omega wings spectra, we also classified galaxies according to their um, stellar properties. And uh, I just want to highlight here that there are two main channels within which uh, galaxies can quench the star formation. One is called, uh, is a um, slow quenching mechanism and is traced here in black. And the other one uh, is traced in green and is the uh, fast channel of quenching that goes under the name, well, that produces the post starburst population. Now in clusters, we have both kinds of galaxies the one that are subject to the slow quenching and the one that are subject to a fast quenching mechanism. That means that there are many mechanisms that can have, that many things that can uh, happen to a galaxy when it enters into a cluster. 
some of these physical mechanisms just involve uh, the gas component. As I said, one is faster and it's the run pressure stripping and the other one is lower and is called the strangulation or starvation. They basically remove the gas, one from the disk of the galaxies and the other one from the halo of the galaxy. In one case, when the gas is stripped from the disk, the star formation is quenched on rapid time scales. In the other case, when you strip the gas from the halo, you have a, a slower quenching of the star formation. Other things can happen in dense environments, such as mergers, tidal interaction, uh, that can lead to the quenching of star formation. But these mechanisms are thought to be less efficient in clusters because galaxies move too fast. And then there are other, other internal mechanisms that can also lead to quenching of star formation that are AGNs and stellar winds. And these again are thought to, to be more effective in the, uh, in some, only in some part of the galaxies. So uh, about the run pressure stripping, what you will probably see here in this video is what happens when galaxies fall into the cluster potential. They basically uh, travel within the cluster, approaching the pericenter, the central region of the clusters, and in doing this, they leave behind a tail of gas. Now, we actually don't know which, well, we don't know. We started to understand lately which gas phases are stripped and to what extent. We would like also to understand better where and when the stripping occurs, if, uh, if the stripping occurs only at low redshift or maybe at higher redshift as well, and actually how many galaxies are affected by run pressure. Uh, so in the movie before, you just saw that uh, um, uh, galaxies lose their gas along their entire life. And this is the attempt that we did to uh, actually measure, um, to infer the presence of run pressure strip galaxies in clusters that are not so nearby. So these are intermediate redshift clusters at redshift 0 0.3 and 0 0.4. No. On the top here, you see um, a belt 2744, and here on the right, a belt 370 that have been surveyed with the MUSE instrument. And the circles here uh, show you the location of the galaxies that from the MUSE analysis, we, um, for which we infer the presence of the run pressures. And the red galaxies are post-starbars. Down here, you see a beautiful example of uh, one of these galaxies in a belt 370, where you see the galaxy here, the stellar disk is here, and here in red, uh, you see the oxygen to emission elongated in a tail. And what we found in the very inner region of these clusters is actually that most of the blue galaxies are either run pressure stripped or post -arbus. That means that also at higher redshift, the, the run pressure is an important mechanism. Now, uh, how does run pressure work? Is it, here is another artistic impression. So as I said, when the galaxy falls into the cluster potential, it feels the pressure exerted by the uh, dense intracluster medium. And so, the denser the gas is and the uh, higher the velocity, the infall velocity of the galaxy here is, the higher will be the uh, run pressure that the galaxy feels. And so it, it is possible that at the end, the galaxy loses their gas from the disk, leaving behind this gaseous tail. Now, uh, this is a mechanism that has been described in a very old paper by Gunn and Gott, 1972. So how did we start to observe run pressure? Actually, by looking at the H1 morphologies in the very nearby clusters, Virgo and Coma. This is uh, the galaxy NGC 4522 in Virgo from a very old, old, very old study by Kinney, 2003, where you see that the stellar light is um, mostly symmetric, while the contours that trace the H1 emission are asymmetric. That means that uh, something is displacing the H1 towards this direction. This is uh, the first evidence of run pressure being at work. But then other uh, study claimed that also other uh, uh, wavelength can trace uh, the run pressure. This is the same galaxy. The contours are always the H1 contours. And the, um, the image below is the H alpha emission. And as you can see, H alpha loosely follow the H1 distribution. 
And this is a big revolution because they started, they started to realize that um, also H alpha can, stray, can trace the stripping. And over here, you see the same galaxy and you see 4522 in a study by Abramson 2016 that make use of HST images to trace also this dust lane that are removed together with H1 and with the galaxy gas. And this is why starting from 2010 until today, um, some H-alpha surveys started to be uh, conducted to detect the presence of this um, ionized gas emission elongated. This is from Yagi 2010, the coma uh, H-alpha survey. These uh, lines here actually show you the extent of the ionized gas days. And a similar study has been uh, proposed also for NGC 1367. That is another uh, nearby cluster by the same authors. Again, the red stripes show you where the HR5 mission is. But then happened what they call the IFU revolution because integral field unit uh, started to become available. And so the presence of these ionized gas stays uh, uh, started to be detected more frequently. This down here is a galaxy in the Shapley supercluster by, Shap by Paula Merluzzi et al. 2013, where she used the WIFE's spectrograph in Australia to show this elongated H alpha tail. And then Consolandi et al. in NGC 1367. This is the galaxy, and this very long tail uh, is ionized gas. And over here, you see the famous ISO 137001 in the Norma cluster as has been observed by MUSE. And this is exactly where our survey started. The survey is called GASP and is uh, devoted to the study of gas stripping phenomena in galaxies. Uh, it has made use of the MUSE uh, integral field unit extensively. We observed more than 100 galaxies. Uh, most of them are located in clusters, but we have also galaxies in the field and in uh, uh, less dense environments. The mass range of the galaxies goes from 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 11.5. And the galaxies that we surveyed have, are characterized by a different degree of stripping. Now, um, the galaxies have been selected on the basis of their appearance in the B-band images of the WINGS survey. So um, before having views, we just had uh, ramp pressure stripping candidates. But then we have MUSE, and I will show you how we infer the presence of ram pressure with MUSE. Uh, I just need to tell you another thing, that the nominal spatial resolution of MUSE is 0.2 arc second per pixel, but actually there is the seeing effect. So um, since the seeing is more or less one arc second, this translates at the um, cluster redshift um, into one kiloparsec size. So we cannot we don't know anything about what happened below one kiloparsec, let's say. The field of view of MUSE is uh, one arc minute square, square. That means that we map a region of 60 by 60 kiloparsec around each galaxy. And for some of them, the one with the longest tail, we had to observe two MUSE pointings. Here is a gallery of GASP uh, uh, galaxies. Uh, the gray scale is actually RGB images extracted from MUSE and the color of the mission trace the H alpha emission. And as you can see, for example, here, um, you have a normal, normally distributed uh, stars and uh, the color thing here says that there is an ionized gas tail as long as 70, 80 kiloparsec. Now, how did we derive uh, the presence of from pressure? Well, basically by comparing the stellar and the gaseous kinematics. Because as I said before, ram pressure stripping is only able to strip the gas without disturbing the stars. So what you see in, uh, uh, with the blue contour is the gas kinematics. And with the red contour here is the stellar kinematics. And as you can see, the stellar kinematics is undisturbed while the gas is completely displaced while it keeps the rotation it had probably in the disk before being stripped. And when I say that the galaxies have a different degree of stripping, I mean that in this case that you see here on the left, it's a galaxy called J026. Um, 
stars are distributed over the entire stellar disk and the gas was and that has been started to be stripped. While what you see here on the right are stars that are um, that fill the stellar disk, while the gas starts to be uh, deprived in the external zone of the disk. That means this galaxies has already approached the pericenter, maybe it already passed the pericenter, and so it started to be a truncated disk. Um, there are a couple of, uh, we, of GASP results that I want to highlight. First one is that uh, uh, galaxies showing the most uh, uh, elongated tail of ionized gas actually host also an AGM. This was completely unexpected. Uh, there is no particular reason for which this should happen, but it is like this. Um, GASP is obviously a limited sample, but uh, recently a PhD student here in Padova, Giorgia Peluso, made a great effort in analyzing all the published um, sample of galaxies ramp pressure strip with and without AGNs. And she compared the fraction of AGN in this literature sample, including GASP, with uh, galaxies that are extracted from manga having the same mass distribution. And that actually what she finds is that the fraction of AGN is higher than the fraction of AGN that is found in normal galaxies that are not ramp pressure strip. Uh, another thing that we'd like to point out is that uh, um, the star formation rate in the disk of ramp pressure strip galaxies is actually announced when you compare it with the, our own sample of control sample uh, of control galaxies that are not disturbed by ramp pressure. And finally, that uh, this, the H alpha emission is actually clustered in clumps, what we call clumps or blobs or knots, um, where we have uh, peaked, peaked H alpha emission. And since we have the complete uh, optical spectrum, we can try to classify the ionization mechanism uh, that is powering uh, the H alpha emission. Um, what you see here in the top right panel is a galaxy that is called JW100 that you will see also later on. And these in red are the blobs of H alpha emission. Now, if we classify these blobs according to the line ratio, including the nitrogen lines, we end up by saying that they are star forming blobs. While if we use a different diagnostic diagram involving the oxygen line, uh, we find that only some of them are actually star forming. The other ones are maybe powered by shocks or different mechanisms. Uh, we can also try to understand the, um, the mass distribution of these blobs so that has a median value of 6.5 in logarithm stellar mass. And we can uh, we also try to infer the size of these blobs, because as I said, we cannot measure anything that is below one kiloparsec, but uh, using local scaling relation and the H alpha luminosities of these blobs, we end up with this uh, uh, size distribution. And um, I will tell you at the end of the talk what we are doing in this respect. Okay, now let's go to the molecular gas. Uh, since we are seeing these blobs of star formation in the tail of ramp pressure strip galaxies, we can think that the, the star formation has to start from something. And so we need to understand whether there is molecular gas that is uh, the fuel for this star formation happening in the tail. And we need to understand also if the molecular gas is the one that was present in the disk that is now stripped, or if it is new molecular gas that somewhat ma somehow managed to form uh, in the from the neutral gas that has been stripped from the galaxy disk. And the other open question is what are the conditions of the molecular gas both in the disk and in the stripped gas days? Now let me make a step back uh, because I need to tell you what was expected about the molecular gas content of cluster galaxies in general. What you see here on the left is a figure taken by a paper by Corbelli et al, 2012, where uh, they calculated the amount of molecular gas in uh, Virgo cluster galaxies. And, they, um, and this plot shows you the molecular gas fraction. 
as a function of the H1 deficiency. So galaxy on the right are H1 deficient, and you see that they are also H2 deficient. However, the H1 is more easily stripped than the H2. So the basic idea was that H2 would remain within the galaxy disk while H1 can get stripped. What you see here on the right instead is the latest attempt to quantify the molecular gas content of Virgo cluster galaxies. Uh, it has been published very recently, and uh, the data comes from the Vertico survey that used the ALMA ACA instrumentation to detect the molecular gas mass in uh, 51 Virgo cluster galaxies that are here the blue points. And uh, in red, or orange, you see the distribution of the molecular gas content of the X cold gas survey of normal field star forming galaxies. And what they claim is that actually the molecular gas content of galaxies in Virgo is normal, if not uh, exceeding the normal molecular gas content of cluster galaxies. So here we have two opposite, say, results. Now let's see what happened in ram pressure strip galaxies. There are a very few studies, you can count them on one hand, about, well, two hand now, um, on the molecular gas content of ram pressure strip galaxies. The first one dates back to 2013, where uh, Yakim and collaborators started to, wanted to analyze the molecular gas content in IC3418, and they found just a marginal detection. But this is a very small uh, galaxy, it's a low mass galaxy. And then they moved to analyze ISO 137001 that has this beautiful H alpha tail traced in pink. And in blue, you see the uh, X-ray emission over here and also in this secondary tail down here. And actually they found molecular gas, both in the disk and in the tail of this ram pressure strip galaxy. They also have the star formation from the H alpha. And so they put all the, uh, their points in this plot that is basically showing the star formation rate, rate density as a function of the molecular plus atomic uh, molecular gas uh, surface density. And they claim that in the tail, the star formation efficiency is very low. If you look at the depletion times, it, they go from 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9. And so down here in the tail, in this pointing 001, A, B, and C, the depletion time are much longer than Hubble time. So that means that they, they will never form stars efficiently. They will get dispersed into the cluster. And the same authors found the presence of molecular gas also in the tail of this other beautiful example of uh, ram pressure strip galaxy that is called D100. These are all single dish observations. But they managed to publish also this paper lately in 2019, where they used ALMA uh, capabilities to map uh, the molecular gas distribution on much smaller scale, 350 parsec. And what they find is that there are compact clumps of molecular gas along the tail out to 60 kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy. This mass is compatible with the largest uh, uh, association that you find also in the Milky Way, but their size and their line width is larger. They also claim that there is a substantial amount of diffuse emission, uh, molecular gas emission, that is increasing with distance from the galaxy center, and that this galaxy is particularly molecular gas rich. Now, what we did uh, for our own GASP survey is to uh, ask for apex observation of four galaxies. Now the apex beam is very big, is 24, 25 kiloparsec at our redshift. And this is what you see here traced with these big circles, red that was meant to trace the galaxy and blue that was meant to trace mainly the tail. Because we needed to understand first whether there was molecular gas in, this tail, in these galaxies or not, or if the molecular gas is completely stripped. And what we found is actually that there is molecular gas, both in the disk and in the tail. And what we did not know uh, using this APEX data set is how much efficient was the conversion of molecular gas into star formation, because while we have a clear characterization of the H2 
charged lamps, we don't know within each apex beam where the molecular gas is located. We made some assumption. One is that the molecular gas was concentrated as the H alpha emission, and the other one was that the molecular gas was completely filling the apex beam. So we made some speculation on this, but the main point was to have a single dish observation with which we could then ask for ALMA data. And this is what we did. So we got cycle five ALMA data in band three and band six, a mosaic observation to map both the CO120 line emission and the CO221 line emission at one kiloparsec scale because one kiloparsec is exactly the uh, size, the spatial resolution of our MUSE data. The uh, initial velocity resolution is three kilometers per second, and the RMS of our observation goes from 0 0.5 to one millijoule kit per beam. And this is the first attempt to detect resolved molecular gas in galaxies that are not so nearby and are subject to ramp stripping. Uh, you see here the CO120 maps, where you see a clear emission in, within the galaxy disk, but also in some regions in the tail. Now, this is the CO120 emission that traces the more, say, less dense gas. The same maps for the CO221 um, show a more clear correlation between H alpha emission and uh, CO emission. But as I said, you can have here in the tail both molecular gas and H alpha. Uh, okay. We can do something more. We can try to quantify now how much molecular gas is located and where. This is uh, the JW100 galaxy. Over here, you see uh, in blue, bluish color, the stellar light emission, and the, in red, the CO221 and the CO120 emission, clearly displaced from the stellar disk. Uh, we um, identified the regions in the disk, D1, D2, and D3, and some regions in the, what we call the near tail, near tail one, two, three, and the, in the far tail. And we measured actually the molecular gas that is present uh, globally and also within these regions. And we found that uh, despite the fact of that this galaxy is a very high mass galaxy, three times 10 to the 11 solar masses, it still has a content of molecular gas that is uh, uh, 2.5, 10 to the 10 solar masses. This is actually 8% of the stellar mass. And this is way, way higher than uh, we would have expected for a galaxy of this given mass. 30% of the molecular gas is actually in the tail. And since for this galaxy, we have been lucky and ACA observation have been triggered, we can map many different special uh, scales. With ALMA, we go from one to eight kiloparsec. With ACA, we reach 19 kiloparsec. And then we have the apex pointing going above 19 out to 25 kiloparsec. And what we found is that even within the disk, only 30% of the gas is located on scales that are below 8 kiloparsec. All the rest is in the diffuse form. And the fraction of molecular gas that is diffuse is increasing as we move uh, far from the galaxy center. Now, if we look at the molecular gas content of all the four galaxies that we have observed with ALMA, uh, that are called JO201, 204, 206, and JW100, we find that the molecular gas fraction, which is the fraction of the molecular gas mass over the stellar mass as a function of the stellar mass is much higher than what is found in normal galaxies, star forming galaxies, the same x cold gas survey here as gray dots. And is even more higher um, when you compare it with the Virgo uh, cluster survey by uh, Corbelli et al that are here in black dots. Now, the different symbols here just tells you uh, what we don't know about the alpha CO. So if I use an alpha CO that is the Milky Way one, I find these uh, uh, um, filled symbols. If I use an alpha CO that is dependent on metallicity 
and on the distance from the star forming main sequence, I found these empty dots, still uh, H2 overabundant. And if I want to get closer to the observed ratio that we found in normal galaxies, I need to use very low alpha CO. That means that our galaxies should be something like starburst, and they are not. So what we speculated is that maybe the, the ramp pressure is promoting the formation of molecular gas. And actually, since for three of the four galaxies that we observed, that we have also the H1 derived from JVLA observation, we can actually measure the, uh, we can make the comparison between the H2 and the H1 gas content. And you see that when you do that, the H2 over H1 is even, is still higher than what you would expect in normal star forming galaxies. And this can be explained basically if you think that the H1 is stripped and the H2 is not. So you are left in the disk with an overabundance of H2, easy. However, when you put together H1 and H2, so you compute the total gas fracture and you compare it with the stellar mass, we end up with something that is in agreement with what is found in the normal galaxies. And so this led us to conclude that probably the H1 is stripped because we see the stripping, but part of H1 is efficiently converted into H2 within the disk. Uh, so we have only four of these galaxies, and this is why we asked again for apex observation of other 18 galaxies with and without star formation in the tail. For all the 18 galaxies, we have the H1 distribution from Mirkat, and we have been granted the eight, uh, 184 hours in B priority, however, with Apex, to measure the total molecular gas content of these 18 more galaxies. Now, they started observing this galaxy in uh, September, so I have some number to show you. And this is just to tell you how the, spec the spectra the line spectra look like. This is a galaxy JO147. Uh, in color, you see the H-alpha emission. The red contours show you where the H1 emission is. And in black, you see the two apex pointing, one superimposed on the center of the galaxy and the other one uh, mainly tracing the tail. And we have clear emission both in the disk and in the tail. And actually, we thought that to observe this kind of galaxies, we made a very conservative assumption. So we wanted to go below the uh, observed uh, values because we think, okay, we thought if the H2 is strict, we need to go three sigma below the re normal relation. So we expected to have observation lasting, I don't know, something like eight hours. And in 30 minutes, the spectra uh, came up. So these galaxies are really H2 rich. For sure, they are not H2 deficient. And of course, we need to increase the statistics with more observation. The other thing that we would like to do is to actually map on smaller scales this H2 distribution. And this is why we asked for um, ACA in the supplementary, last supplementary call. And so we have this pending proposal to get the resolved observation for three galaxies in the cluster Abel 3558. Okay. Now, we asked to have ALMA at one kiloparsec resolution, and now we go and compare ALMA and those. Again, this is the JW100 galaxy, the CO emission on the left. On the right here, you see the CO kinematics, two to one and one to zero. But more importantly, what we can do is to map, uh, to get the star formation from the H alpha emission that you see here on the left, to measure the H2 surface mass distribution with the uh, um, ALMA, and then uh, by comparing these two quantities, derive the star formation efficiency or the opposite of the star formation efficiency, which is the depletion time. Now, just notice that this galaxy seem to have a hole here, and the hole is due to the fact that we don't involve in this calculation any sparks that, according to Muse, is powered by a mechanism that is different from star formation. And since this galaxy has an AGN, we had to mask out the sparks that are dominated by the AGN emission. 
So what you see is uh, that uh, there is a clear gradient in the depletion time. In the disk, it is uh, smaller. And in the tail, the depletion time is uh, longer than the Hubble time again. So the star formation efficiency is low. However, if you remember uh, at the beginning, some slides ago, I was pointing out the region that we uh, identified both in the disk and in the tail of these galaxies. The D1, D2, D3 are in the disk and the other one, the, the greenish one are in the uh, near tail and the bluish one are in the far tail. Now, this is the same plot as before, star formation rate density as a function of the molecular gas surface mass density. And here again, the red lines are constant depletion times, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 giga year. Normal galaxies, normal star forming galaxies at one kiloparsec scale show an average depletion time of uh, two giga year. This is from BGL work. And this galaxy actually is uh, much less efficient in uh, transforming molecular gas into stars. Um, and, is, and this is true, not only in the tail, but also within the disk. Now, what happens to the other three galaxies? Well, the situation is much more standard, let's say. This is the W100, the one that uh, we were seeing before. This is a 204, 201, 206, where you see that uh, basically they have a depletion time of about two giga year. In all of these galaxies, there are places where the star formation efficiency is lower, but mostly they follow a normal scaling relation. So if the star formation efficiency is normal and the star formation is enhanced, as I was telling you at the beginning, the only way out of this is really that the quantity of molecular gas is increased due to the ramp pressure. Uh, we can make the same exercise that I did for JW100 and uh, extrapolate the uh, map of the depletion times. And uh, by looking at the JO204 here on the left and JO206 here on the right, it seems that the depletion time is long in the tail, as in JW100, but it's somewhat longer also where uh, you have the compression front. So the galaxy is heating. The, <laughs> the gas, the ICM is hitting the galaxy in the direction of these arrows. Now, there is another thing that we can do to understand what happened to the molecular gas in the tails, especially, which is the following. Um, so I try to be clear here. In each knot that has a H alpha emission from muons, we know from muons whether it is star forming or not according to the line ratio. We know the size of the knot. We know where the knot is. We know the ionized gas velocity and velocity dispersion. And we also know whether the contribution of the diffuse ionized gas is important or not. This comes, this is another piece of, of information that comes from the analysis of the line ratio. So for each star forming knot, I can extract the CO221 and the CO120 line emission from the same physical region. I can put them at the same current velocity, and I can fit the, emission, the CO line with one Gaussian. That is sometimes not enough. And what I end up with is the molecular gas mass within each knot. And obviously, since I have the H alpha and the star formation rate, I can have the depletion time. So, um, as I said, I don't know whether you see it clearly, there is a small red empty circle here. From this region, I extracted the red spectra, that is the CO221, and the blue spectrum, that is the CO120 emission, with their Gaussian fit. What you see in gray instead is the um, H alpha emission with its own velocity, and the width of this rectangle is the H alpha velocity dispersion. So that means in each star forming knots from mu's, we have a corresponding value for the molecular gas. The depletion time of this blob, for example, is 3.7 giga year, 
but I can do the same exercise for any blobs, more or less. Some are not so nice, I need to admit. But I can calculate, as I said, depletion time and molecular gas masses for all the knots that are in the strip tail. Uh, uh, this is a bit more difficult. So uh, if I divide the star forming knots in disk and tail, here disk are um, circles and tail knots are squares, I can also try to understand how much efficient is the star formation uh, episode in each of them. For example, in this galaxy, J0201, it seems that the star formation is even more efficient than in the tail than it is in the disk. Look, here are the squares that correspond to this position in the tail, and then the circles that are within the stellar disk that uh, is traced here by the green contour are forming, star, forming stars, say, normally. Typical depletion time, two giga years. Crosses here and the um, and well, the crosses basically tells you um, that in the knots where you have a high component of emission due to the diffuse ionized gas, the star formation is completely inefficient. And this is true for J0201, that is this galaxy here, and it's true also for the other galaxies. Now, let's try to compare what we know from H alpha and what we know from molecular gas. Uh, this is taken from a work by Bianca Pojanti, 2019. So the star formation is taking place in H alpha knots that are dynamically cold. Their average or median velocity dispersion is 30 kilometers per second. The H alpha luminosities are typical of giant H2 regions. Their median stellar mass is something like 3, 10 to the 6 solar masses. And the star forming clumps in the tail and in the disk are basically following the same relation. In these plots, you have the star formation rate as a function of the gas mass. And the green points are the knots in the tails, and the black points are within the disk. So what do we know from molecular gas? is that the velocity dispersion is variable. It goes from 20 to 80 kilometers per second. But for the JW100 galaxy, that has a completely different behavior. The uh, mass of the molecular gas, again, is highly variable in the different galaxies. It goes from um, 10 to the 8 solar masses to more than 3 10 to the 9 solar masses. And again, as I showed you before, we know that the star forming clumps seem to follow normal scaling relation. Now, what about sizes? As I said, we, uh, with MUSE and with ALMA, we cannot go below one kiloparsec, but we are trying to do this. So we asked to observe six Gasper galaxies with HST. So we have data from cycle 28 in both broadband filters, two in the UV and then two in the optical uh, regime, plus one narrow band filter mapping the H alpha emission. And you see here, and also behind me, how beautiful is, uh, are the HST images, uh, because they have a resolution of 70 parsec. So we go now from one kiloparsec muse to 70 parsec HST. One kiloparsec is here in this plot showing the uh, H alpha luminosity as a function of the size of each emitting blob in these four, five, six galaxies. So before this, we only know what was happening above 10 to the 3. And now we are trying to mark what is happening below 10 to the 3. And we find that these very massive and uh, uh, luminous emitting blobs in the days have sizes that are very, very small. This is a work that a PhD student is uh, uh, doing in Padova, Eric Junke, and uh, we hope to have a soon a publication on this. So mm -hmm. take home messages because I think that I'm running short of time now. So the molecular gas content within the disk of ram pressure strip galaxies is increased with respect to what we would have expected. 
And this probably means that the RAM pressure shipping is promoting a fast transformation of H1 into H2. In the taste, the molecular gas is formed and it leads to efficient star formation, at least as efficient as it is in the disk. So that means that somehow, we don't know how and, and why, star formation can take place in a very hostile environment. Because I remember you that these galaxies are very close to the cluster center. So around them, they, have a, they are surrounded by the hot intracluster medium. And still, they manage to uh, form cold gas from which the star formation can take place. And finally, the star formation is globally normal. But then each star forming knots can be more or less efficient depending on the geometry of the stripping and the trajectory that the galaxy is falling uh, is uh, having falling towards the cluster center. And I think I'm done. Thank you very much. I'm here to take any question you might have. Thank you very much, Alessia. Thank you. So uh, let's see some hands for questions. Uh, Ruben, uh, does anybody have questions in the auditorium uh, in the meantime? Oh, uh, Gilberto, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much Hi. for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, a former student of mine performed some simulations of ram pressure strip galaxies. And one of the things she found was that the the gas being stripped, I don't know if you can see my hands, but yes, it, yes. it formed like loops around, like this. Uh, something that remind me a lot of cigarette smoke. Um, yes. So looking at your observations of the increased molecular gas formation, maybe could it be possible that these rolls um, the, the compression that is generated by these rolls may, may push up the formation of molecular gas. But since this is a hydrodynamic compression and not gravitational compression, it doesn't increase the star formation rate. And so you get inefficient star formation. Does, does it make sense to you or? Uh, yes, it makes sense. I was expecting to have actually an increased uh, um, turbulence, so a higher velocity dispersion uh, towards the compression front because of this, but it seems that it's not. So I didn't show this because I don't have any clear results on this, but I was expecting that where you have the compression front, maybe the gas is, say, uh, molecularized more efficiently, and that I can trace this with the turbulence. But I wasn't able to, to prove this yet. OK. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Gilberto. We have a question from Rosa. Um, hi. Hey, okay, very nice talk. Um, I had already mentioned this to Bianca when she gave a talk. And uh, maybe we don't see molecular gas where it is, but where it uh, has certain excitation conditions. So could it be that in, with RAM pressure stripping in this kind of galaxy, the excitation conditions of the molecular gas are different? So it's not that we have more gas, but that we can see it because of its excitation conditions. I had made this comment to Bianca also. Hmm. Um. So you mean that basically the condition of the gas are such that we measure more gas than there is? Right. Not, not more than, yeah, you, ah. apparently you measure more, but it's not that there is more, but that it has, you have more gas that is in such excitation conditions that you will so, get. Okay, this is maybe what I was uh, uh, meaning when I referred to very peculiar alpha CO. Maybe. 
maybe so yeah have, maybe. something something is peculiar it could be yes. that you have more gas or it could be this or it could be also the excitation conditions just another venue of yes that that could be into. yes yes thank you for the suggestion well this is what uh, this very low alpha co is hinting towards but then i don't know how to solve the thing but th this is this can be actually yes yeah i i don't know if it I, it's not my field but i don't know if some simulations could be useful i mean yes it could be but also maybe we can try to trace also other lines other j right. stage and see what happens well we try to ask for the co3 to 2 emission but they say the that it wouldn't add anything i don't yeah. agree but uh, or, or another we, we can try another type another another molecule not <laughs> yeah maybe another molecule yeah okay well, thank you so much thank you thanks rosa it looks like we have a question from the auditorium. Yes, we have. Uh, so I say you mentioned uh, that uh, the very low alpha CO uh, happened basically in uh, starburst galaxies. So you are more confident that uh, the more or less standard alpha CO uh, would apply to this. But uh, these are uh, galaxies. Uh, this is a bit of a follow up question to Rosa. These are galaxies that are forming stars at a rate which is higher than normal galaxies. So um, could, could it yes. not be? Uh, allora, um, yes, but they are not starbursts. They are not so much more star, star forming than a normal galaxy. By the way, uh, lower alpha CO have been observed in, gal in normal galaxies, but only close to the center. While here, uh, I need to have this very low alpha CO over the entire disk if I want to go close to the normal star forming population. So I think that there must be something um, changing the gas condition in the entire disk. A pure star bust is too much. And uh, uh, an al a low alpha CO at the center is not enough. Okay. If and this answers your question. Uh, would like observe the CO letter or uh, other other line like HCN help to uh, address? Yes. yes, this is what I tried to answer before. We were, we wanted to trace the CO three to two. Uh, because you know the the CO ladder changes from normal to starburst galaxies, but maybe the CO three to two is too close to the CO two to one to see a real change. Maybe we need to go to lower, uh, sorry, to higher J uh, level. And I forgot what you asked after. Uh, like ah, yes, HCN, HCN, yes, but it's very difficult to detect. Yeah, because it's it's, it's faint, but uh, would yes. it help? Like uh, at least you can you can probe uh, the, the very the dense gas. gas. Yes, yes. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Jacopo. I think we have a comment about probably the same thing from uh, Rosa. Yeah, yeah. So I think I also have mentioned this to Bianca, and it has to do with starburst galaxies. That it was not this long, long ago that the disk of disks of starburst galaxies ap apparently had less missing mass than normal galaxies. And that could have been a lot of things. No, now we know maybe it would be, could be the proximity effect of Mond, but it could also be that more molecular gas was excited and you could and you could detect it so so to me this means that maybe these um these galaxies in some way are intermediate between normal galaxies and starbursts in yes. several possible ways so maybe it would be interesting to to explore that i'm taking notes thank you thank you very much for the suggestion you're welcome thanks again rosa yeah. Do we have any more questions from the auditorium by any chance? Okay. Um, from anyone else? Oh, we, we do. Oh, Rosa again. Go ahead. No? Oh. No, thank you. I was trying to lower my hand. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, 
Okay. If there are no more questions, then let us thank the speaker again. Thanks very much, Alessia. Thank you very much. It's a, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Hopefully, and thank you uh, also for the suggestions. Huh? Yeah, hopefully we can have you actually visit in person, as you were saying, soon enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope so. I would like very much. Thank you. Okay, bye thank then. You very much. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.